a few days before Christmas, I wait in the arrivals lounge at the Manchester Airport in Manchester, New Hampshire. I have watched other families and loved ones greet each other as they enter the lounge after a short flight from Boston. I am waiting for my wife, Dr. Emily Walker, to return to my home. Emily has been working in Puerto Rico for the past six months, and I haven't seen her in about a month since Thanksgiving. My name is John Walker, but my friends and co-workers call me Johnny for obvious reasons. I'm the same age as my wife, 27, but if she's a doctor, I became an engineer and work in the city here in Manchester. I'm six feet tall, have dark brown hair and brown eyes. Emily and I were high school sweethearts, were each other's first love and first lovers. We went to college together, but I graduated early since Emily was still studying to be a doctor. We married shortly after graduating from college almost two years ago and have been renting a nice three-bedroom house in North Manchester for several years now. Emily's first job after medical school was working for an NGO, non-governmental organization, called Doctors Without Borders. They give doctors six or 12-month contracts to work in third world or difficult economies where medical care is desperately needed. Many young doctors like Emily take this opportunity to gain experience. Plus, working in humanitarian aid always looks very good on a resume. Emily is halfway through her 12-month contract, having first traveled to Puerto Rico back last summer. It's hard to have a long-distance relationship. We've been so close and done everything together since we were 16. These periods between her going home are the longest I've spent without her in the last 10 years. I missed her so much. As I walked past the other passengers, I saw the wavy blonde hair of an attractive woman. That's my Emily. She's five feet seven inches tall with long wavy blonde hair and beautiful blue eyes. Her smile grew even wider when she saw me waiting for her and walked over to me, holding out her arms for another hug. Hi, honey, it's so good to see you, Emily said as we hugged. Hi to you too, beautiful. You look even better than you did a month ago. You've been working on your tan again, haven't you? You look amazing, I replied. Thanks, I try to tan every day when I can. There's nothing to do but work, replied Emily as we walked to the baggage claim. We spent the next hour or so finding out everything Emily had missed over the last month, although I'm not that good at gossiping. She didn't tell me much about her job, only that it had been business as usual since she was last home. While Emily was in the kitchen calling her mom, I helped her carry her suitcase upstairs to our bedroom, unzipped and opened it so she could start unpacking when she was ready. As I opened the lid of the suitcase, I noticed an article of clothing on one side of it. I pulled it out to examine it. It was a red see-through teddy. I had never seen her wear it before. Maybe she bought it to surprise me since it looked like new. So I put it back and closed the lid of the suitcase. After we ate dinner, I was looking forward to doing it with Emily again. It had only been a month, but even that was too long. I half expected her to come to bed in her red teddy I'd seen earlier, but instead she came out of the bathroom in a long t-shirt. Maybe she was saving it for a special occasion. We spent Christmas Day at my parents' house, since Emily's parents had moved to Florida a few years ago. On the third day of Emily's visit, I still felt like something was missing, that spark that we usually have. I thought back to Thanksgiving, and I have to say that the two nights Emily was home weren't the best either. I chalked it up to the fact that she was tired from traveling too, and she also told me that she'd worked herself to exhaustion too, and needed a well-deserved rest while she was here. What about now? She doesn't seem tired or worn out now, but at the same time, she doesn't have the spark and enthusiasm that she had before she left in the summer. Maybe I'm just fantasizing. Maybe I'm remembering our lovemaking as something better than it actually was. But I don't think I am. When the last day and then night came, I was still waiting for her to bring the new red teddy I'd seen in her suitcase. If ever there was a night for it, it was tonight. Emily is flying out in the morning, so tonight is our last night together until she comes back for the weekend at the end of February and then spends a week here for Easter. I was disappointed when she came into the bedroom again wearing only a roomy t-shirt, one of my old ones. I was tempted to ask her about the red plush, but I didn't, focusing on giving her the good love she deserves. In the morning, after taking Emily to the airport and saying goodbye to her, I watched her plane take to the sky to take her away from me again. It is these days that take the most energy as the countdown to her return begins anew. But that wasn't all that was eating at me. I'd never felt so disconnected from Emily as I did during those vacations. It was like we were just doing our chores, even though I was doing my best to make her trip memorable. I didn't feel like Emily was trying as hard as I was, and now I'm having a hard time shaking that feeling off. 
Is it about her job? Is it about me? Is it that by traveling and meeting new people, she has found that she now wishes she were married? Is she tired of our marriage, or am I just seeing things that aren't there? I shook my head as I walked back to my truck. I had to get to work. On the way to work, I couldn't resist delving into my thoughts. When Emily first left for Puerto Rico last summer, she had called me every day, sometimes twice. But even those stopped around September, and now her daily calls have become only weekly. I tried calling her more often, but each time they went straight to messages, and she later told me that she doesn't turn her phone on while she's at work. But that doesn't explain why she does the same thing after work. Anyway, she'll call me when she gets back to Puerto Rico. Nearly two months of phone calls is all I have. When I got home from work that afternoon, I realized that Emily still hadn't called me, and she was supposed to have landed in Puerto Rico some time ago. I tried to call, but it went to messages again. What the hell? She wouldn't be back to work until tomorrow. I changed my clothes and headed to the gym. We have our own machine in the garage to save money. Working out helps me forget about the stresses of the day, as well as the anxiety I was feeling about Emily right now. After taking a shower, I checked my phone. There was still no call from my wife. Then I started cooking dinner, finally relaxing in front of the TV to eat alone as I was used to. When I was ready for bed, I decided to call one last time, but I was redirected to her messaging service again. What are you doing, Emily? How can you forget to call your own husband when you're back in another country? The next morning, Emily finally called me at work, saying she was busy preparing for work yesterday, which is why she forgot to call. That didn't explain why her phone had been off for most of the afternoon and evening, but I accepted it. We didn't talk for long, she said she was just taking a little break and needed to get back to work. From that morning on, Emily only called me once a week, always on the weekend, always on Saturday morning. Whenever I tried to call her at other times, I would always get to her messages and she would use some random excuse, usually about her working late. Even our calls on Saturday morning seemed more like an assignment, like she was checking in because she had to. If I had any anxious feeling at Christmas, it was now growing into a real concern. Emily's trip home at the end of February had passed, and I was still left with the feeling that something was wrong between us, that Emily was just repeating familiar behaviors while at home. By Easter, I did my best to put all apprehension aside as we met each other again at the airport. But in the five days that my wife was home, it only exacerbated my fears. She seemed detached again, almost aloof most of the time. Our lovemaking was casual at best, to be honest. While we were still best friends, as we always had been, it was the romantic and physical side of our relationship that suffered the most. On the last day of her trip home, I decided to talk to her about what was on my mind. Emily, is something bothering you? We just don't seem to be as close as we used to be. I can't explain it, but something's not right. No, nothing is bothering me. I haven't noticed anything between us either. I'm still very happily married to the man I love. Why do you think something is wrong? Asked Emily. Because we don't communicate the way we used to. You seem almost aloof when you're at home, like you'd rather be somewhere else. We rarely talk when you go back overseas. You never return my calls. Your phone is always off, even when you're not working. Should I go on? John, I'm sorry, but working in Puerto Rico has been much harder than I could have imagined. The constant long hours, the multiple shifts, and all the stress that comes with it. What little time I don't work, I spend sleeping or lounging by the pool, trying to relax as best I can. I'm sorry I don't call you all the time. It makes me feel even more alone when I talk to you. Besides, what are we supposed to talk about? You're always asking about my work and I'm trying my best not to think about it. We don't have to talk about your work. I'd like to be able to talk to my wife for more than just 30 minutes once a week. That's all you're giving me. Again, I'm sorry. I'll call more often in the future, okay? I didn't realize you were so worried about it. I nodded my head at Emily. Maybe I'm reading too much into all this. I'm hoping that when her contract is up in June and she comes home for good, we can get back to normal. I was glad I voiced my concerns and she left me on good terms. Although she promised to call more often, we were soon back to once-a-week phone calls. Emily must have even set a reminder in her phone for 10 a.m. on Saturday mornings to call me. Now she always called at that exact time. June was approaching and I was glad that her contract was coming to an end, that we could live our lives again and hopefully be ourselves again. I was tired of being alone. I missed her more than I could have ever imagined. Emily was supposed to fly home on Sunday morning. However, I was expecting her to call me as usual on Saturday morning, but there was still no call. 
By 11 a.m. I tried to call her, but again I got to her messages. She can't work on Saturday right before flying home. She even told me that her work contract officially ends yesterday, so what's going on? I tried calling her later Saturday afternoon, and again in the evening, but always ended the conversation when the call went straight to messages. I was beginning to feel like the parent of a naughty child, overbearing and controlling. Today I left the first message for her to call me, so why the hell did she turn her phone off or not even check her messages? Emily's behavior when it comes to keeping in touch with me has gotten to the point where I don't see any other reason other than she doesn't want to talk to me or is busy doing something else where she doesn't want me in her way. Maybe with someone else, that's my real fear. Early Sunday morning, I finally got a text from Emily. She apologized again for not responding to me sooner and then gave me the flight time. She would be flying home to Manchester at 3 p.m., so I had a free morning before I needed to head to the airport to pick her up. I made sure everything was ready and then went for a run and worked out in our makeshift gym. The whole time I was running and then working out, I couldn't get Emily out of my mind. It bothered me that she was having an affair while she was in Puerto Rico. I couldn't see any other logical explanation. And as an engineer who is taught to solve problems through logical thinking, it was the only reason I could understand how Emily had been acting over the past year. It explained why she had become less and less likely to contact me and seemed more emotionally detached when she was at home. It may also explain why her phone goes off so often when she shouldn't be at work. If she was with someone else, she wouldn't want me to call her. If she was having an affair, it would all make sense. But what do I tell her? Ask her straight out. What am I basing this on, my gut feelings and no phone calls? I've never been a petty person or a fan of wallowing in gossip. Instead, I've always relied on facts, figures, and reality. I just can't start accusing her of something I don't have any facts about. And besides, how would it affect our marriage if I did? She would find out that I don't trust her, and that would make things even worse if she hasn't actually slept with anyone at all. No, I'll do what I do best. I'll bury my feelings and emotions and just deal with what's in front of me. Emily will come home this afternoon, and maybe all of this will be behind us and our lives will return to normal. Emily's welcome upon her return felt really warm, and I was glad she was finally home. We quickly began to return to family life, although I still felt that we were not yet back to the relationship we had before she left for Puerto Rico a year ago. It just didn't feel the same. Emily is still a pleasure to talk to. She can be fun and genuine, warm and loving. All the things you would want in a best friend, but you need more than that from a wife. You need the emotional connection that a loving couple needs, and right now we are lacking that. My wife spent the first week after her return attending several interviews with the job she really wanted being at Manchester's main hospital, Elliott Hospital. By the end of the week, she gave me the happy news. She had been successful in her interview. Working at a major hospital meant that there were opportunities for career progression, and I was very happy for her. It also meant no more overseas contracts with her previous employer, which was a big reason I was happy for her. By the end of August, I was less worried about us. Emily had been in her new job for almost three months and seemed to be enjoying it. Although I still felt that we were no longer the same as we had been before her 12-month absence, I had come to the conclusion that perhaps this is how marriages happen. Passion and lust naturally fade over time, and perhaps that is what happened to us. Though I'd say it was mostly one-sided, Emily seemed to lose some of her passion for me, not the other way around. The last few weeks have been particularly revealing, as if we're just two good friends living in the same house rather than a young married couple in love, and I have no idea why. No, that's not true. I have my suspicions. It's a Sunday morning at our house in early September. I've just made us both breakfast and coffee. I have a busy day planned. This morning, I'm helping a friend with a home renovation, and this afternoon, I'll be arriving at the site for one of my jobs. I almost never do work on the weekends, but this was inevitable. Good morning, John. You've already made breakfast. What would I do without you? declared Emily, kissing my cheek as she walked into the kitchen and sat down to eat. Good morning, sweetie. I have a busy day planned. I hope you don't get bored sitting home alone all day. I replied, piling on the bacon I had just cooked. Oh, I'm sure I can think of something to do. Maybe even go out for a while. Are you going to walk or catch an Uber? I replied, sipping my coffee. Right now we only have one car, my Ford truck, which I need today. I'll think about it. What time do you think you'll be home? asked Emily. Probably around 6 p.m., maybe 7. Were you planning on making anything for dinner tonight? If not, I can always grab a snack on the way home, I asked, finishing my bacon. 
You better grab something in case I go out for a while. By the way, I wanted to tell you something, Emily replied. You're not pregnant, are you? I smiled back. It used to be a standing joke between us when she said she had something to tell me. No, I can't believe you're still using that phrase. I wanted to tell you that there's a big healthcare conference coming up in two weeks at the Boston Convention Center. The organization Doctors Without Borders has asked me to attend to help educate young doctors about the benefits of contract work abroad with them. To sell the dream, so to speak. But you don't work for them anymore. Why would they ask you? I replied, leaning back in my chair with my coffee. They always ask the doctors who have done contracts for them in other countries. It can't hurt. I might want to contract with them again sometime in the future. Who knows? I thought you were happy to work for Elliot so you wouldn't have to deal with contracts anymore, especially overseas. I replied, more than concerned that she might want to leave again. I'm happy with my job, John. Look, I'm just doing them a favor, nothing more. It's a two-day weekend conference. The booths are open both Saturday and Sunday. I'll get there by train. They'll pay for me to stay overnight in a nice hotel with meals included. So it won't cost me anything, replied Emily. So you're inviting me along? Is that what this is all about? I'll be able to sightsee around Boston while you work in the booths, I replied, finishing the last sip of my coffee. No, they only offered room and board for one, sorry. But the hotel room will fit both of us. We don't even need to tell them that. I'll pay for the food myself, I replied. Sounds good, but I don't want to mess around with reservations. The hotel will want to charge them for a dual reservation, not a single. It's only two days and a Saturday night, plus I'll be working most of that time. We can go to Boston together some other time, okay? replied Emily. Okay, fine. At least I gave it a try. Hey, I gotta go. Peter's expecting me there in about 30 minutes. If you get out, call me and let me know where you're going, okay? I can probably pick you up later, I replied giving her a kiss on the cheek before starting to put on my work boots. I'll be fine. Maybe I won't go out at all. I don't know. Bye, sweetie, Emily replied as I walked out of the kitchen, heading towards the exit of the house. Today I was helping Peter with the concreting as well as some other chores. The other chores were taken care of as we were still waiting for the belated concrete truck to arrive. It was already three hours late and the time was nearing noon. Then Peter finally got the call that the concrete guy had some serious problems with the truck and was canceling all work today, so that freed up most of my day. I had planned to leave for the job site at half past 4 p.m., but called the customer to see if he could get there earlier. I was relieved that he would indeed be able to meet me at 1 p.m., so I said goodbye to Peter and headed out in my truck to get ready to meet the client. What I expected could have taken two hours. We had it sorted out in just 20 minutes. The customer knew exactly what he needed, so I didn't have to spend time explaining all the options. When we were done, I checked my phone to see if Emily had texted to say she was going out, but I had nothing, which meant she was still at home. So I headed home where I could take a shower and then spend the rest of Sunday afternoon relaxing with my gorgeous wife would be in order. As I entered the house, I called out to Emily that I was home and started to take off my work boots so as not to get the carpet dirty. Receiving no response, I called out to her again walking through the living room and kitchen to the laundry room to throw clothes into the washer and then headed to the bathroom to take a shower. I went into our bedroom, but Emily wasn't there, so I quickly looked out into the backyard. Emily still wasn't there. I got in the shower. I was a little annoyed that she hadn't called and told me where she was going like I'd asked her to. I swear, sometimes it feels like only one of us is married, but whatever. As I changed in the bedroom, I thought about Emily's red teddy. I still hadn't seen her wear it since I noticed it in her suitcase when she was home for Christmas. If she wasn't going to wear it, why did she buy it and bring it with her from Puerto Rico? And why would she have it in Puerto Rico anyway? Obviously, she had taken it with her when she went back there. That was another thing I couldn't explain to my wife. Her underwear drawer is right above mine in our dresser, so I opened it to see if she still had the little red stuffed animal or not. It took me a little digging, but I found it like it was hidden in the bottom and back of the drawer. When I pulled it out, something wasn't right. It looked like it had been worn quite a few times and washed. Some of the trim around the waist was a little torn. I also noticed that one of the buttons in the front was missing. Clearly she had worn it. It looked brand new the last time I saw it in her suitcase. But when did she wear it? She never wore it for me. And how can you wear out a plush toy unless, well, 
unless you wear it while someone is entertaining you. What other conclusion am I supposed to draw from this? It explains why she hid it in a faraway drawer. Maybe it's not meant for me. I put her plush toy away where I found it, hiding it in the far drawer like Emily did. Where the hell is Emily? I asked her to let me know where she was going if she went anywhere. I picked up my phone and called her, but it hit the messaging service again. What the hell? Not this shit. There was nothing left for me to do but wait for her to get home, so I decided to marinate some steaks for us to eat tonight. After that, I headed to the gym again. I needed to get the thoughts of Emily's infidelity out of my head. At 5.30, I heard the front door close as Emily entered the house and headed into the bathroom to take a shower without calling out to me or saying anything. She must know I'm home. My truck is parked right out front. Again, odd behavior, unless she has something to hide. When I heard the shower turn off, I went into the bedroom to say hello to her. So why didn't you text me to tell me where you were going like I asked you to? What, are you my parents now? I'm sorry for caring about my wife. Maybe I should care less, not like you, I replied. I was just out with my friends, okay? I didn't think you needed to know where I was every minute. But why was your phone off? You can't use the excuse that you were working this time. It wasn't off. I must have accidentally put it on silent. What's this all about, John? I shook my head. The only thing I could say in answer to that question was that I think she's cheating on me. But I don't have any evidence for that accusation, so I didn't say anything. Did you at least bring anything home for dinner, John? No. I've got some steaks marinating right now. I'm going to barbecue them in a minute. Maybe you can help with the salad if you want. Sure, but you'd better clean the barbecue first. Go, replied Emily, trying to push me out of the bedroom. Okay, but I need to go to the bathroom first, replied I, heading to our bathroom. Wait, I just need to grab my dirty clothes to take to the laundry room. Emily replied quickly, pulling out her clothes she had just worn from the laundry basket. I stood there wondering why Emily was bothering. Again, what is she hiding? After going to the bathroom, I headed to the laundry room to get the portable barbecue we had stored there. I noticed the washing machine was already on. It only held the clothes we both wore today, barely enough for a load. It felt like she was trying to wash off any evidence that might be left of her clothes. Or maybe I'm just getting paranoid and imagining things. Over the next two weeks, not much changed in our relationship. Things went on as they were, but that's all I could say about them. As much as I wanted to, I just couldn't shake the feeling that something was going on, that Emily was hiding something that her emotional attraction to me had waned since she'd left for Puerto Rico 15 months ago. I'd hoped things would get back to normal after her contract ended, but it's been almost four months and we still haven't gotten back to normal. Now I'm going to be paranoid that tomorrow she's going to go to Boston on her own and spend the weekend there. Could she be there with someone else? Am I being played? It's Friday night, so I figured I'd give her the best night ever to remind her of me while she was away for the weekend. But no such luck, she belted out, my time of the month just started. I swear her period ended just two weeks ago, but what can I do? Saturday morning, I dropped her off at the train station and headed home. I was completely free this weekend. I had no plans. I walked into our bedroom and sat on the edge of the bed, not knowing what to do to occupy myself. I would do a workout later and go for a run, but what to do with the rest of the day? I looked around and noticed that Emily hadn't closed the underwear drawer in the dresser when she packed up her clothes for the night this morning. I got up to close it, but found myself wanting to take another look at her red teddy, as if it symbolizes the misgivings I have about my wife. It's something that I just can't explain. I went through all of her underwear in the back and bottom of the drawer, but I still couldn't find it. I kept looking, where is it? I pulled the drawer all the way out and put it on the bed, going through all her clothes to make sure I hadn't missed it. No, it definitely wasn't there. Had she really taken it with her? Why would she do that? There was only one reason, but I didn't want to admit it to myself, even though I knew the answer. I put her drawer back in its place and checked the other clothes drawers and the laundry basket in the bathroom. There was nothing there. I checked the washing machine in the laundry room, empty. I even checked the trash to make sure she hadn't thrown it out, but also to no avail. Screw it! She must have taken it with her! All of my suspicions I've had up until now have finally been vindicated and I can no longer make excuses or deny what now seems obvious to me. My wife must be having an affair, I have no idea with whom, but it must have started with someone she worked with at Doctors Without Borders in Puerto Rico. Of course! 
My wife will be in Boston with others from that NGO over the weekend. I bet the man she had an affair with will be there too. Will she wear her red teddy for him today, whoever he is? And what about since she'd gotten home? That didn't explain her still aloof demeanor, especially in the last month. Her head was splitting with confusion and anger. Would Emily really do this to me to us? We had it all. We were high school sweethearts, dated together in college, then married and lived together. Up until her contract in Puerto Rico, things were just fine between us. Why would she risk ruining what we had? We have been best friends and lovers for the past 10 years, but lately it seems like we are just housemates and nothing more. I don't know the answer. I just know that the pragmatic side of me, the logical and fact-based side of me, needed proof. I needed a slap in the face from her infidelity before I would finally come to terms with it and not confront her. I put on jeans, shoes, polo shirt and jacket, grabbed my keys and headed out the door. I'm going to Boston, going to her convention, and I'm going to figure out for myself what's going on. As I entered the large convention hall, I picked up one of the brochures that also had a layout of all the vendors. I found where the Médecins Sans Frontières organization booth was and headed over there. I'm not dumb enough to just walk up to Emily's booth and expect to see something indecent. No, I would stay back and circle the other booths from a distance from which I could observe her, who she was with and how they interacted. When a representative from some medical device company started telling me about their products, I saw Emily in the distance. She was sitting with another woman chatting at the back of the booth, and two guys, clearly also employees, were chatting with the audience as they walked by. After 20 minutes, I ran out of questions for the guy who was talking to me and moved to another booth from where I could continue to watch my wife. For the next two hours, I continued to watch her. The two guys had left much earlier, leaving Emily and her coworker behind. I didn't see anything strange. Emily would talk to people as they passed by the booth. Sometimes she would give someone more time if they were genuinely interested in the NGO. I was starting to get bored of this, so I found one of the restaurants inside the building and grabbed a bite for lunch. When I went back to check on Emily, she wasn't there anymore. The two male employees had returned instead and were working in a cubicle again. I wandered around trying to find my wife, and then I remembered the food hall where I had just had lunch. Perhaps that was my best chance of finding her. Maybe she's eating lunch there, just like me. At the third establishment I passed by, I spotted her sitting with the same employee she'd been working with all morning. I quickly turned and walked away, sitting down at the food stand some distance away. But from there, I could still watch her. Sitting here, I think about what I'm doing and the fact that I feel like shit right now. Do I really enjoy spying on my wife like this? Watching her and observing her like some amateur sleuth. I should be better than this. Emily deserves better. What the hell am I doing here? I stood up and walked away, leaving the convention center to sit at the entrance and gather my thoughts. What do I hope to find out by being here? That she's with her lover in the middle of the convention she works at? No, if she is with him, it will only be in the evening after work. She'll go back to her hotel room, where they can be alone together, out of sight. But I don't even know what hotel she's staying at, let alone the room number. And what would I even do if I did? Sit in the hotel lobby and wait for her to walk by? This whole trip seems pointless. I'll probably never find out what I think is going on with Emily. It's just ridiculous. I got up, about to head to the garage where my car is parked, but ended up going back inside to check on Emily one last time, like I couldn't let her go that easily. I found her in a booth. She was chatting with another woman again. Two guys were there, too. I wondered if one of the guys was someone she might be having an affair with and began to watch her carefully as she chatted with both of them. One of them was larger, fatter, and hardly a match for my wife. The other man was a little older, taller, thinner, and obviously balding, and again I could not see him being of interest to my wife. When she talked to both of them, it seemed quite normal, just like the interaction of people working together. Maybe I'm just being paranoid. Maybe nothing is going on and I'm just making it up because our life hasn't been as good as it used to be for a long time, and I want to blame it on something or someone else. It's now three in the afternoon, the convention booth's close at five. I figured I could wait for Emily to finish work and see where she goes and who she goes with. In the meantime, I needed a beer, so I headed over to the big bar I'd seen earlier near the food court. It was already pretty crowded, with people sitting at all the usual tables, so I took a bar stool at the end of the bar. There were three people standing next to me talking. Obviously, they were working at one of the booths today. They were very loud, and it was hard for me to even enjoy my beer when they were talking. Eventually, they left, and I ordered a second light beer. 
After all, I'm driving as I don't intend to stay here overnight. About 20 minutes later, two more guys took seats at the bar right next to me. That's when I realized that these were the same two that Emily had worked with today. My first thought was that maybe Emily was about to join them and find me sitting here. Then I decided that Emily and the other woman were probably working at the kiosk until 5 p.m., since they seemed to be alternating with the two guys who were now drinking beer next to me. They started talking about work and then about someone they used to work with, some guy they both knew. I distracted myself from their conversation, which had been going on for about 20 minutes, and checked the time. It was almost 4 in the afternoon. Picking up a mouthful of beer, I wondered if I should leave after my beer. Emily seemed to be doing exactly what she said she was doing here, and I felt like an asshole for doubting her. I'd never been jealous or suspicious of Emily before she left for Puerto Rico, so why was I becoming so now? The red teddy came to mind. Emily always turned her phone off when she wasn't at work. Besides, our intimacy had suffered too, but was that enough to suspect her of cheating on me? Is it? Finishing my beer, I was about to get up and leave when the guy next to me mentioned Emily in a conversation with someone else. Have you met Emily Walker before today? The pretty blonde in the booth. Have you spent any time in Puerto Rico since last Christmas? Asked the other, slightly larger guy. No, I've never been to Puerto Rico. Most recently I worked in Guatemala and before that in Honduras. I've never met her until today, but she's very attractive. Her husband is very lucky, replied the older, taller, skinny guy. I felt good in a way. Yes, I was very lucky. I don't know how lucky her husband is. I was with her in Puerto Rico until last Christmas. Have you worked with Ryan Knight before? He's one of the senior doctors who's been with us for a number of years. He was a team leader in Puerto Rico. He and Emily spent a lot of time together, and I mean a lot. The larger guy replied, chuckling slightly. What? I almost turned to ask the guy what he meant, but I remembered that I don't know these guys. What the hell though? They're talking about my wife and this doctor, Ryan Knight. Yeah, I know him. I worked with him early last year in Honduras. He seemed like a nice guy, happily married and with kids. Did he really have an affair with Emily? Not an affair, I'd call it a torrid affair. They couldn't get enough of each other shortly after she started working for us last summer. She came to us beautiful and innocent, like a flower ready to burst forth. She wanted to impress Ryan too, and I guess he couldn't resist. From the beginning, every moment they weren't working, they were having fun. You could hear them doing it day and night in the dorm we all lived in. He even changed her roommate and moved in with her himself, which was not supposed to happen. Two married people of different genders living together like that. He only got away with it because he was the boss. The bigger guy continued. I was stunned. All this time I'd been wondering if something was going on, and now this guy had just laid it all out for me. I couldn't believe it. I felt numb. Wow, okay. So Ryan's finally over it? Is he home in Chicago now with his wife and kids? Well, I talked to Emily just before, asked her if she was in touch with Ryan or not. I mean, it was pretty clear that they were a couple then. They both lived together, had dinner together, were inseparable. It's not like their relationship was kept secret or anything. But here's the interesting thing. She told me that he now works with her at Elliott Hospital in Manchester. According to her, he only started working there a month ago. I think she probably helped him get a job there too, but she'll never say so. Wait, he got divorced? He left his wife and kids for Emily? An older balding guy asked. I asked her about it, well, if he's even divorced now. She said no, he's just working with her for a while, whatever that means. I'll bet Ryan told his wife he's off on a contract somewhere overseas while he's having fun with a young doctor in New Hampshire. He's just crazy to pull something like that, to lie to his wife to be with Emily. To do that with a wife and kids at home is just tinny. The balding thin guy replied, and I agreed with his point of view. It's tinny. Emily ruined our marriage too. You say that, but you haven't seen Emily sunbathing on the beach or by the pool in Puerto Rico. If you saw, my goodness, even you might wonder. The fatter guy replied. No, I couldn't live with myself if I ever did that to my family. No matter how great she is, it's not worth it. Besides, she's married, so now she's working and no doubt sleeping with Ryan again. And then what? Will she go home to her husband? The skinny older guy replied. Yeah, I know it sucks to be him. Well, don't talk about it when she gets here after five. It's really none of our business if she wants to have fun outside of marriage. I bet Ryan will probably be here soon, too. 
There's no way he's going to pass up the opportunity to spend the night with her. The larger guy replied. Well, it'll be great to meet Ryan again. Although I can't say I'll respect him as much now. What he's doing is not good. I could never even think about doing shit like that to my wife and kids. The balding guy replied. Come on, even for a hottie like Emily? Man, I'd give my left nut to spend just one night with her. The bigger one replied, chuckling out loud. But you're single. You don't have a wife and kids at home to think about. There's more to life than just having fun, even if she's 10 out of 10 like Emily. The balding guy replied. Fair enough, just remember that mom is the word when Emily or Ryan gets here, okay? Sure. I was still trying to pick my jaw up off the ground. Hearing them talk about my cheating wife with her lover still made me feel like I had just been punched. Everything made sense to me now. Everything made sense. Even her recent behavior was understandable. She was having fun with this Ryan guy again. She must have spent all day with him that Saturday when she was out of the house, which was why she hadn't answered her phone and wanted to shower right away when she got home and wash her soiled clothes. My anger reached boiling point. I wanted to grab the fat guy and ask him, what else did he know? But instead I tried to act casual, stood up and walked out of the bar. I swear, if someone had bumped into me on the way out, I probably would have punched them. I went and sat down in front of the convention center again. It was now half past 4 p.m. Did I want to wait to see her with him? To find out who this Ryan guy was? No, it doesn't matter to me who he is. I'm more angry with Emily than anything else. I don't care if he's cheating on his wife. I don't care at all. All I care about is that Emily is cheating on me. That's all I care about. What angers me most about Emily is the lies and deceit, not just the betrayal. If she fell in love with this guy right after she arrived in Puerto Rico, why didn't she break up with me then? At least she should have had the courage to do it when she got home. Instead, pretending we were still good, doing it with me afterward when she clearly didn't love me anymore. Why? And now, to help this guy get a job in our hometown where everyone knows us, she continues her affair right under my nose. I can't understand this complete lack of respect for me. It's like she's rubbing up against me. That's what I can't understand. Why would she do that? I've given her everything I can. We've always been best friends and lovers since high school days. I've never kissed another girl other than Emily, let alone anything more with anyone else. And now she's flaunting her infidelity like she doesn't care about me at all. How did we get to this point? The only thing left is, do I really need to see her with him with my own eyes? To clear my doubts. Maybe. I think of it as closure. The fact that once I see her with another man she's romantically involved with, I'll realize once and for all that our marriage is truly over. I tried to pull myself together, but it was difficult. My mind was still spinning with thoughts, anger, frustration, and questions. The main question was why? Why, Emily, why did you decide to cheat on me? It's five o'clock in the evening now, so I got up and went back to the house when most people were already leaving. I don't want to confront her yet. I just want to see her with him, for myself, for closure. I headed towards the bar, stopping and sitting down at a coffee shop nearby. From where I'm sitting, I can see the end of the bar where I was earlier. Two guys are still there, along with Emily and another woman. A third man was there now, a tall guy with nicely slicked back brown hair who looked fit and was well-dressed. He had been standing next to Emily and now had his arm around her waist as they stood and socialized with the others. This must be Ryan, the same guy my wife cheated on me with. Seeing my wife standing with another man as he put his arm around her, demanding her for himself, is hard to take. Until today, I thought Emily loved me and me alone. Even with all my suspicions, I hoped and prayed I was wrong. It's hard to explain this moment, to see her with him with my own eyes. She broke my heart and all my trust in people in one fell swoop. What am I going to do now? Do I go out there and confront her? Do I punch this guy in the face and tell my wife to back off? I want so, so badly to go in there and vent my anger. But no, I don't want an assault charge on top of the pain she's already causing me. My pragmatic side tells me not to make rash decisions while I'm emotionally upset, that I need to go home and calm down first. Now I have proof I got what I came here for. I pulled out my phone and turned on the video, zooming in to capture them. As if on cue, Emily turned slightly toward Ryan and kissed him on the lips. Just a quick kiss, but it clearly showed what he meant to her. I pressed stop and headed into the garage. It felt strange walking into our house that we'd shared together for years. While Emily had been in Puerto Rico, I had felt lonely here, but now our house seemed different. 
Now it only served as a reminder of what should have been, but is now gone. It would be hard to sleep tonight, knowing that my wife was being entertained in a hotel room by her lover in Boston, while I lay here alone. Once again, the only question I had was why? Why Emily? I decided to go back outside, go to a bar or something, get some dinner and maybe have a couple beers with friends. I just didn't want to be alone. I didn't get home until 2 in the morning, and I had no trouble sleeping after drinking too much the night before. The morning hangover seemed to exacerbate my bad mood about marriage. I needed to clear my head and decide what to do before Emily got home this evening. One thing I knew for sure was that our marriage wasn't going to continue as before, and I wasn't going to pretend I didn't know, or that I was going to accept that. No, it was definitely over, but now what? Pack up and move? No, screw it. She's the one cheating. Let her go and live with her boyfriend. He's probably renting an apartment somewhere in the city. He even works with her now. How do you do that? So blatantly lie to your wife about where you are? Does she even know he lives in New Hampshire and works here? At that moment, I realized what I needed to do. I opened my laptop and went to the Doctors Without Borders website to see if they had any data on him. They didn't have any, at least not publicly, so I checked popular employment sites by typing Ryan Knight Physician Chicago into the search engine. I got a result. When I went to his profile, it indicated that he had recently worked in Honduras and Puerto Rico as a team leader with Doctors Without Borders. I went to his contact information, and he indicated he lived in Chicago and provided email and cell and home numbers. Bingo. I made myself some coffee and sat in the backyard sipping it. Do I really want to go through with this? I'm suffering through the destruction of my own marriage right now, and he helped it happen. But it's not his wife and kids' fault. Do I want to ruin their lives too? No, but his wife deserves to know. She should know the truth. Besides, he has no right to ruin my life and walk off into the sunset with both mine and his wife. I got up and went back into the house and called the home phone number listed on the employment website. Hello, this is Melissa speaking. Melissa Knight, I answered. Yes, that's right. Hello, Melissa, this is Kevin from Doctors Without Borders. Could I speak to your husband Ryan about an opportunity we have for him? I replied. I'm sorry, but he's already working for you. He's in Costa Rica right now. That can't be. It's not in our database. I know his last contract was in Puerto Rico earlier this year. Is that correct? Continued I. Yes, that's correct. But he recently left on a new contract in Costa Rica about a month ago. Maybe you should call someone there to clarify things. Or you could call my husband at his number. Although the reception there is really bad, my calls almost never get through, replied Melissa. Really? We've never had a problem with cell service in Central America before. Besides, I don't think we have room in Costa Rica. The healthcare system there is very good. Could you do me a favor? Could you check your husband's flights to Costa Rica and if you can, let me know the flight number? We pay for all travel so I can look it up in our database and get it sorted out quickly, I replied. Yeah, sure. Just give me a minute, I'm not on my laptop right now, replied Ryan's wife. She took a minute or two to log onto her laptop and look at their email before replying to me. That can't be right. I can't find any emails on here about his flights. Give me a minute. I'll check the airline booking site we use. Melissa continued. Thanks, Melissa. That way it will be much easier for me to double check everything in our database. I added as she typed away on her laptop. Okay, here it is. Oh, that's weird. His flight was only one way from Chicago to Boston. He usually flies through Texas to Central America, with a layover in the country he's headed to. I don't see why he would fly to Boston, and there don't seem to be any other flights after that, replied Melissa. Really? We never book flights through Boston unless our contractors live in the Northeast. What's your flight number? Maybe I can check to see what happened, continued I. Melissa read out the flight number, and I pretended to type it in somewhere while she spoke. There's nothing in our database. He didn't come through us for this flight. Are you sure he's working on our contract? There are no other companies or NGOs he might be working for? I asked his wife. No, he told me the contract is with Doctors Without Borders in Costa Rica for six months. I'm 100% sure of that, she replied. Well, I don't know what else to tell you except that he's not working for us right now and that we haven't paid his flights, lodging, or salary lately. Perhaps if you check your bank statements, you'll see details of another flight he paid for, or be able to find out who paid his salary. I realize this is probably a bit strange, 
but I don't have anything for him right now, which is why I'm calling to offer him some work. I replied. Hold on, just give me a minute. Melissa answered with a sigh. I could hear her typing away. If nothing else, she would now be suspicious of her husband and want to know the truth. This can't be happening. What the hell is going on? Melissa spoke aloud, though it was clear she wasn't addressing me. He hasn't withdrawn any money from our bank account in the last month. How the hell is he even paying for anything? Melissa said out loud again. Maybe he got an advance before he left or he has another bank account, I replied. No, we only have our joint account and there are no advances in it. Why would he open another account? I can't answer that question. Have there been any recent deposits into your joint account? Surely he must be getting a paycheck if he's working somewhere, I asked. Yes, there have been three deposits so far, each week for the same amount. They're all bank transfers, seem to be from another bank. The details say it's from a bank in Manchester, New Hampshire. Why would he transfer money into our account from a bank in New Hampshire? It doesn't make any sense, she asked aloud again. Well, it's about an hour from Boston. I guess that explains the one-way flight to Boston. It's weird, I continued, begging her to bite. What's weird, replied Melissa, taking my bait. We only have one other doctor in our database from Manchester, New Hampshire. I had her last contract. He was in Puerto Rico and worked for your husband for a year, up until June. What was he doing in Manchester with her? I wonder if he is working there with her again. It would make a lot of sense if you were now receiving remittances for his salary from a bank there. I replied, the hint of his wife was obvious, even if I played it cool. That's impossible. What would he be doing in New Hampshire with some woman who worked for him before? Why didn't he tell me about it? Why didn't he tell me about the flights and the bank accounts? Oh, God, Melissa's voice broke. And there it was. She had just realized the full implications of this. She had just realized that her husband was cheating on her, lying to her. Who is she? This woman who lives in Manchester? What's her name? Almost demanded Melissa. I can't divulge personal information of our former employees. I'm sorry. I answered as if I meant it. But she's a doctor, right? Continued Melissa. Well, I only contract with doctors. That's what I do. I answered her. Manchester can't be that big. Surely there can't be that many hospitals there. He must be working in one of them, replied Melissa. I'm sorry, Mrs. Knight, I don't understand. I added as I continued to act out the play. Don't worry, I'll find out where he works and what he does. Maybe there's something else? I don't think my husband would want to work for you at the moment, replied Melissa. Okay, I'm sorry for all the confusion I caused. I hope you get it sorted out, replied I. Oh, don't worry, I'll figure it out, stated Melissa firmly before ending the conversation. It couldn't have gone any better, but why do I still feel like a big piece of shit for doing this? I can't enjoy ruining her life, even if her husband and my wife are the real reason for it. I'm just helping her find the truth. With that over with, I needed to decide what to do about Emily. I decided that I wasn't going to move out. Emily should do it. I went to the garage, got our two suitcases, took them into the bedroom and started packing her clothes. They were full before I was even done, so I took our last suitcase from the laundry room, packed the rest of her clothes and all of her stuff from the bathroom. Once I was done with that, I carried all three suitcases to the front door, leaving them there for when Emily got home tonight. With that task accomplished, I headed to the gym for a run. As I sit here eating my lunch, I'm trying to think through what I'm going to say to her and what she might say in response. I'm determined not to lose my temper. I don't want her to see how hurt I am right now. No, I'm going to have the courage to do what she should have done a year ago. End this once and for all. I watched sports on the TV to pass the time. It was almost six in the evening, and soon Emily would call me to pick her up at the train station. That reminds me. I picked up my phone and turned it off. Two can play this game. At half past 7 p.m., I hear a car stop in front of the house and the door close. Then our front door opens and closes. As Emily walks into the living room where I am sitting, I see her stop and sigh. John, why is your phone off? You were supposed to come and pick me up and I had to carpool home. And why are all of our suitcases standing by the front door? Asked Emily, plopping down on the couch next to me. I'm so tired. It's been a very stressful and tiring weekend. 
I feel like I need a few days off now to recover. Emily continued when I didn't say anything else. Those suitcases are for you. They're full of your clothes and things. I know exactly why you're so tired after last night. I know who you spent that night with. I know everything, I replied calmly. John, what are you talking about? You don't understand anything, Emily replied with a note of concern in her voice. You can stop lying, Emily. It's all over now. You should have had the courage to end our marriage a year ago after you started cheating on me. Things have been going our way ever since. I didn't understand why, but I do now. I kept my composure as I answered her. What are you talking about? About cheating? What are you trying to say, John? I love you, Emily replied, raising her voice. She seemed to be starting to realize that everything was falling apart now. Yeah, that's right. You haven't loved me since Dr. Ryan Knight started entertaining you every day and every night while you were in Puerto Rico. Like I said, I know all about it. Emily fell silent. Her eyes began to water. Finally, she jumped up and ran into the bedroom, closing the door behind her. It annoys me that she doesn't even have the courage to admit it now that she's been caught. Maybe she's been lying for so long that it's hard for her to admit what she's been doing. I stayed on the couch watching TV. I'm not going to talk to her, knock on our bedroom door, and ask her to come out. Screw that, she can come to me. This is all on her conscience. She needs to figure that out for herself. It had been an hour since Emily had run off to our bedroom. I decided I needed to eat and headed to the kitchen to make something. As I'm sitting on the kitchen bench eating heated noodles, I hear our bedroom door open, and a red-eyed and still crying Emily comes out of there. She walks into the kitchen and sits down on a stool on the opposite side of our bench. John, we can talk. I have something to say, said Emily quietly. Sure, come on, let's hear it, I replied, finishing my noodles. First of all, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I never meant to hurt you, not for anything in the world. I never meant for any of this to happen. I really didn't mean to, Emily confessed sincerely. And yet, once it happened, you kept doing it over and over and over, replied I calmly. I know I feel terrible about it. I bet you don't. You liked having fun with him. That's why you kept doing it. You need to stop lying to me. Be honest for once, I replied. Emily turned away from me, breaking eye contact. She then closed her eyes and sat in silence for a few seconds before looking at me again and speaking. You're right, John. I really enjoy doing this with him. Every time I came home to you, all I could think about was being with him again. Being with him again. I hate that I feel this way. I hate what I did to you, admitted Emily. Then I'll ask you again. Why didn't you just end our marriage as soon as this all started? Why lie to me, pretending that we were happily married when all you wanted to do was have fun with some other guy? Because because I didn't want our marriage to end. I've loved you since we were teenagers. I couldn't imagine my life without you, and I still can't. So I kept telling myself that I could end it that I was just losing my temper, that I was just having fun, and that I didn't love him the way I love you. I kept telling myself that it would soon be over and we would be happily married again. And yet he lives and works here now and you're having fun with him again. It's hardly like you want it to be over or for you and me to be happily married. Hell, you even spent all last night with him after I asked you if you wanted me to come with you for the weekend so we could enjoy a hotel room together. You outright lied to me. You planned to be with him the whole time. None of this is an accident. You've been lying and scheming for over a year now. I'm sorry, it's true. I only went to Boston so we could be together. It was hard to find time to be alone. Well, I'm sorry if my being around keeps you from having fun with someone else, Emily. You found time two weeks ago while I was away, didn't you? You just finished having fun with him right before you came to my house, I added. Yes. I'm sorry, John, I really am. A little late for that, don't you think? You just got home after organizing a weekend away with another guy, and all you can say is sorry? Regret doing it or regret getting caught? I know that nothing I say will probably improve the situation, which I did. But I love you, John, more than anything. More than anything in the world? You're kidding, right? You've been having fun with another guy for over a year now, not wanting to do it with me. And yet you sit here with an honest face and say you love me more than anything in the world. Do you have any idea how utter bullshit that is? I do. And I know you're hurting right now and that it's all because of me. 
I know you don't want to believe me, but I love you, John. I really do. My actions don't show it, I know. Never mind that somewhere deep down in that twisted place you call a heart, you've convinced yourself that you still love me. Now you're just lying to yourself. There is no love between us. You made sure of that shortly after your trip to Puerto Rico. All the lies, the deceit, the betrayal, the pretending when you came home. Now I know why your phone always went to messages when you weren't working. Because you were busy having fun with it, weren't you? You didn't even care enough to call me back or want to talk to me afterward. All you wanted was him. Well, now you'll have him all you want. I couldn't call you. I was overwhelmed with guilt. I just couldn't do it. I knew what I was doing was wrong, that I was hurting you, but I couldn't explain it. I couldn't stop. I didn't want to. Well, you should be happy now. You can have fun with Magic Man Ryan whenever you want. Now you're free to do whatever you want. I even packed your bags for you. You see, I'm a good husband all the way. John, that's not what I want. I want you. I always have and always will. You're the only man I'll ever love, I swear to you. This time, Emily was almost pleading. Like I said, it's too late for that. If you seriously think I would want to be with you after what you've done, then you must have far less respect for me than the little you've already shown. You think you can just apologize and say you love me and that will somehow make things better? What the hell, Emily? You ripped my heart out and stomped on it. And now you want to sit here and rub it in my ears. Just get your suitcases and get out. Our marriage is over. We're separated. I hate you so much right now, I replied, finally giving in to my emotions even though I was trying my hardest not to. Emily's tears flowed again. She stood up and walked towards our bedroom. I finished my noodles and opened my beer. I deserved one after all this. I went back to the living room and sat down at the table to continue watching the game on TV. I don't know what Emily is doing in the bedroom. Her things aren't there anymore. She's probably crying, feeling sorry for herself that the perfect world she built for herself has finally crumbled. Thirty minutes later, Emily walks out of our bedroom and stops in the living room to talk to me one last time. John, I know you hate me right now, that I deserve it, and you won't believe anything I say. But I have to say it anyway. From the moment we started dating in high school, I knew you were the man of my dreams, the man I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. Everything about you was so beautiful, and I loved you more than I ever thought possible. Even in college, when everyone around me was partying and sleeping around, it never occurred to me that I would want to be with anyone but you, and I knew you felt the same way. And when you proposed to me and we started living together, I thought my life couldn't get any better. Honestly, I was so happy. Everything I ever wanted had come true. I can't explain why I slept with Ryan for the first time when I wasn't home. I could blame it on loneliness, boredom with you, whatever. But I knew what I was doing and I wanted it to happen. I knew what the consequences of that choice would be, but since then, I've tried my hardest to bury it, to convince myself that I'd never have to face it. I know it was stupid, but I was so afraid of losing you, of not having you in my life or around me. I think I got too complacent about our relationship, about you always being there for me. That's the only possible reason I let it happen. I know I ended our marriage with this. Deep down, I always knew this is what would happen. If I could take it all back and never go to Puerto Rico, I would. But that's just fantasy. I'm sorry I hurt you. If you only believe one thing I say, please believe it. Hurting you is the last thing I wanted to do. I hope that one day you can forgive me. I hope you can move on with your life and be happy again. Goodbye, John. With those words, Emily turned and walked out the front door, grabbing the handles of her suitcases and dragging them to the street, where I heard a car waiting for her. She didn't say where she was going, whether she was going to stay with him or not, and I didn't care. I feel that her little speech is meant more for her than for me. She's trying to justify her act so she can live with herself after what she did. That she would like to leave memories of what we were, not what we have become. And that she would want to leave me with kind words, not mean ones. But I truly believe that actions speak louder than words, and her actions have already said more than enough. To say that the next few weeks were difficult for me is a massive understatement. I even had a hard time focusing on work. It was almost impossible for me not to think about Emily and what she had done to me. After a few weeks, I finally contacted a divorce attorney and started the process. I decided it was better to get it over with than to stall. The other problem is the house we are renting, even though we have lived here together for several years. It reminds me of her. Everything reminds me of her. 
In two months, our lease was expiring and I decided to move out to start over. Moving into a new apartment, I hoped that it would be a new beginning, that I would start to move on from Emily, that I would finally see the light at the end of the tunnel. I was contacted by my attorney, the divorce papers were ready to be served, and I was asked for Emily's address, which I had no idea about. I advised him where she worked and he would be able to find her at the hospital. Later that day, I received a call from the attorney informing me that there had been a complication. It turned out that Emily no longer worked at the hospital. She was fired after Dr. Ryan Knight's wife, Melissa, sued her husband for divorce. It was filed at the hospital, and Dr. Emily Walker was listed in court documents along with their place of employment. The hospital administrator fired both Emily and Ryan. Emily for referring Ryan to them without telling them about their personal relationship, and Ryan for not disclosing his relationship with Emily. All in all, the hospital washed its hands of her. So where is it? How do I get my lawyer to serve her with divorce papers? I gave them the address and contact info for her parents in Florida. Maybe he can contact them and find out. Besides, there's also Melissa, Ryan's wife. Maybe she knows where her husband lives and if he's living with Emily now. I dialed her home phone number. I wasn't going to trick her this time. Hello, this is Melissa speaking. Hi, Melissa. You don't know me, but we've spoken before. The last time we spoke, I told you my name was Kevin from Doctors Without Borders. Yes, I remember, and thank you, I guess. Otherwise, I would never have known what was going on with my husband. You're welcome. My real name is John John Walker. I was married to Dr. Emily Walker, the woman who had the affair with your husband. Yes, I know who she is. Are you still married? Well, that's why I'm calling you. I was hoping you could help me this time, I asked. I'll help if I can, replied Melissa. Both Emily and Ryan were fired from Elliott Hospital because you filed for divorce and named them as your employers. They fired them for not disclosing their personal relationships. Yes, I know. I spoke to the hospital administrator, demanded that she take action, or I would drag them through the mud for allowing married employees to hire their lovers with the hospital's blessing. She wanted no part of it, Melissa replied. Good for you. Melissa, I'm calling because my attorney is trying to serve Emily with our divorce papers, but I don't know where she lives or where she works after being fired. I was wondering if you know where Ryan lives. Maybe Emily is living with him? I know where Ryan is. He lives here in Chicago in an apartment near our house. He said he wanted to be close to his kids, though I'm not sure why. He spent most of their lives living and working overseas, and I don't think he'll be here long. I don't know if he brought Emily with him. I'm not sure, Melissa said to me. Can I get his address and phone number from you? Maybe my lawyer can contact him and find out if my wife, I mean my ex-wife, is living with him, I replied. It's hard, isn't it? To stop thinking of her as your wife. It's the same for me. Be strong, John. We'll both get over it eventually. I'll text you his details after we talk. Thank you, Melissa. I hope you're doing well, too. I can't imagine how hard it would be if Emily and I had kids, too. It's probably not easy for them, either. They're not really having it that bad. I think it's because their dad has barely been in their lives so far, and now things aren't much different from what they're already used to. That's the only plus. Yeah. Well, I hope you're entertaining him for every dime he has, added I. Oh, yeah. My divorce lawyer, she's an absolute bitch, and I love her. She's really expensive, too, so I'm lucky Ryan is paying for her out of all the money he made on his contract. I get the kids, the house, the car, and 50% of his salary for at least the next 12 years until our kids turn 18. He deserves everything he's entitled to. Yes, without a doubt. Emily and I have nothing to fight about. We've just started out on our journey. We don't have children or a home. Things should be pretty easy for us. Well, it's better to start over when you don't have children together yet. I don't know what to do. Who would want to be with a 30-year-old divorced mother of two? I even gave up my career to look after the kids. Soon I'll have to dust off my resume and go back to work, Melissa replied, grinning slightly at the end. I'm sure you'll be fine. Thanks again for sending his information. Hopefully I can get her to sue and get this over with, I replied. All right, goodbye, John. Take care, Melissa replied when we were done talking. Ryan's wife sent me his address and my lawyer had someone check to see if Emily lived there too. But it turned out they weren't together anymore at least according to Ryan. He said that she had a new contract with Doctors Without Borders 
and that my lawyer should contact them about her whereabouts. It turned out that Emily was now working on a six-month contract in Honduras, and my attorney informed me that he had no way to get her care until she returned to the United States. I was not happy that the case would drag on even longer. But soon, to my surprise, Emily was already working with a divorce attorney, serving me in my home. It was simple. She didn't ask for anything. Six months passed, and we were officially divorced. In that time, I have never seen or heard from Emily, nor do I expect to in the future. I'd like to say my life is great now, but I'd be lying. My job is fine, my family is fine, and my friends are good. It's just hard when I feel like I've lost the other half of myself, my best friend, my only lover. I'm told it will get easier with time, that I'll find someone new to be with. But I'm not sure about that. What I had with Emily was all I ever wanted. I don't know if I'll ever be able to truly trust someone again after what she did to me. Sometimes there are no happy endings, just an end to what was. And then those involved try to deal with it and move on with their lives. I hope everyone is right, that things will get better every day. But it doesn't feel that way to me right now. It feels like I'm just dealing with it, burying the resentment as far as I can. I still don't understand why she did it, and I probably never will. The end. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, so subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.